All right. Uh, welcome to week two. Uh, this is probably the hardest topic for this whole course. We get it over with nice and early. Um, the fact that you've already played with tables and you know what rows and columns are uh, kind of allows this topic to be moved up earlier in the semester. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about normalization. Now, before I continue, I want to make sure I'm actually recording. There we go. It's important. So before we talk about normalization itself, we need to learn about um, a specific content concept known as functional dependencies. Um, I've been teaching database for database topics, I should say, uh, for 17 years. And one thing I noticed over the years is that nowhere do the profs actually talk about functional dependencies. It is um, an interesting topic to know about. It's important to understand it. Um, and I decided this semester for you guys, I was going to shorn it into the course so that you have the understanding of when I start talking about certain kinds of dependencies during the process of normalization, you have a little bit of theory that's behind it. So a functional dependency is the concept that specifies how two different attributes are related to each other. Not talking about entities, we talked about entities and relationships, but attributes also have relationships with each other. So within a single entity, certain attributes are related to other attributes and there's rules on how that's governed. Um, usually you'll have one or more attributes that determine the values of another attribute. These are usually identifiers that become primary keys later on in the process. They're known as determinants. So when we're talking about functional dependencies, there's actually a notation that exists for this. And it is essentially, well, the example we've got on screen is X arrow Y. So it's saying the attribute set on the left side of the arrow, in this case, X is known as the determinant. It determines the value of all the other attributes, in this case, Y. So you have two sets in this, for this example, it's kept simple. There's only one value on each side of the arrow, but you can have multiple values on the left, multiple values on the right, multiple values on both sides. Uh, but specifically, when we talk about functional dependencies, there's three properties and six kinds of functional dependencies. All right, so the properties are as follows. Reflexivity, man, that didn't want to come out. Re uh, reflexivity. So if Y is a subset of X, then X determines Y. Fairly straightforward concept. So if Y is a subset of X, X determines Y. Augmentation. If X determines Y as a valid dependency, so like it's reflexive, then XZ would also determine YZ. So if Z's on both sides, it works. Um, transitivity. So this is actually the most important one of the three. Um, well, the first one and the third one are the important one. The second one is rarely used. Um, if X determines Y and Y determines Z, and they're considered both valid dependencies, then X determines Z. Okay, so if I were to write it down the board as a single entry, so if we have X determines Y and we have Y that determines Z, that means that X determines Y, which determines Z going across. Therefore, since this one determines this one, it also determines this one, which means X, and now people back there can't see it because of the pedestal. X determines Z. So this is the transitive property. In other words, a an attribute is determined by an attribute. 
that is in turn determined by another attribute. So you can transit through one attribute to get at the other one. That's why it's known as transitivity. So it transits, it travels through it. All right, so that's the terminology. The two big important ones is reflexivity and transitivity of when we talk about the properties of functional dependencies. Augmentation is very rare. Uh, normally, if you have x, z determines y, z, normally you just have x determines y, z. You just don't have it on both sides. Okay, now the types of functional dependencies. All right, a trivial functional dependency. And a trivial functional dependency is the most common type. That's why they call it trivial. It's because it's basic. In other words, if x determines y, y belongs to x. It's trivial because that's the rule. Then in, the, in this case, y is always a subset. It always belongs to x all the time. So a non-trivial dependency is the other way around where x is equal to, x determines y, but y is not a subset of x. It doesn't belong to x. It just happens to be connected, but it doesn't actually determine it. Um, those we get rid of later on in the normalization process. Essentially in the end, all we want is uh, trivial functional dependencies, also known as full de fully dependent. Uh, Multi-valued functional dependency. Um, it's when there is a set of values. So A determines B, A determines C, but there's no relationship between B and C. Um, once I start actually doing the normalization process, a lot of this stuff will start making sense. I'm just putting out the definitions up front. Um, so multi-valued means there's multiple entries. They're not related to each other. It's like a list. So A determines B, C, D, E, F at the same time. So all those values exist simultaneously. A good example of that would be a list of, val of skills, right? Dan has SQL, database design, PHP, blah, 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 right? I have a list of skills. PHP and database are not dependent on each other. But all this whole list is all determined by Dan. Therefore, that's a multi-value dependency, as in I have a single thing that has multiple values in it. Transitive functional dependency. All right, it's the same thing as when it's the, the property that we just talked about. If A determines B and B determines C, therefore A determines C. It's it's this. Um, this is one of the types that most people have a hard time wrapping their brains around when we start talking about this. Um, a fully functional dependent C is if R has X, Y, X is the determinant, X determines Y, X determines Z. Um, and then you have a partial dependency where a non-key attribute depends on part of the key. So if I erase this, and I'm just going to write it out instead of, and this you'll see actually when we start talking through uh, the rest of the normalization process. So if we have x, y, z, actually let's go with uh, We decide that x, y determines z, and we know that z is determined by y, but not is determined by x, but not by y. So we can say z like this, because z is not the dependent on this; it's partial. In other words, it's if this is the entire determinant, and it only depends on part of it. When I start playing with real data, it'll make more sense. Um, so a partial dependency is when you have an attribute that depends only on part of the identifier. So we have a compound key, which is why we try to stay away from composite or compound keys, because it introduces potentials for partial dependencies. If an attribute is only dependent on part of the primary key, that's known as a partial functional dependency, or we just call it a partial dependency. 
All right. This is the worst part of the lecture. I promise. Um, it's just a bunch of definitions. In practical use, we'll only care about two of these definitions. Well, three. Basically, these three on this slide is the one we're going to care about. But once we start playing with data, it'll make more sense. Okay. So, what is normalization? Database normalization is the process of decomposing and organizing entities and attributes that make up a database. So we're going to take, we take complex structures of data, we break it down to the smaller pieces that are easier to manage. We want to eliminate redundancy. We want to ensure consistency. We want to simplify and we want to eliminate anomalies. I will be talking about anomalies momentarily. So Essentially, the goal of normalization is when you change a value in the database, you change it in one place, one time, and only in one place, and in only one time. You have a store. In this store, products are sold for a certain, in a properly normalized database, when you change the price of a product, you change it in one place. You just do a price update on a single product. You don't have to go through a bunch of other tables changing the price everywhere. Payroll is another good example. Somebody gets a raise. Whenever that actually happens. And you want to only have to change their salary once in the HR system. Because if you have to change it in multiple places and it's a human that needs to do it, there's always a risk that they miss one. So suddenly you have a discrepancy in how much someone's supposed to get paid. So that's data redundancy. Data consistency means that if you only have to update the data in one place, there's less risk of inconsistencies in your data. Simplification, again, if you have to change the data in only one place, it's a lot simpler than if you have to change it in four or five places. And anomalies, which we are now gonna talk about. So there's three kinds of anomalies. There's an insertion anomaly. It's when you add new rows, when you add a new row, you force a user to create duplicate data. I got examples in a moment. Deletion anomaly. We delete a row, and when you delete that row, you could lose data that you'll need later. And update modification anomaly means if you need to change a value, you have to do it more in one place in the same table. All right, so here's my happy example table. And essentially, I'll just grab my little pen here. Okay, so if we look at this, we've determined that um, we should be, there should be an underline here. This is actually from a really, really old textbook, like really old. Um, it's a textbook that they used when I was in school. They're still using it now, but it's just, you know, several editions newer. It's the same example they had back then. So we look at this table. We've determined that the primary key of the, the identifier is the employee ID plus the course title. Fantastic. Here are some of the anomalies we have in this. So Margaret Simpson works for marketing. She's got a $40,000 salary. She's taken two courses. Cool. Insertion anomaly. I need to hire a new employee. If the identifier is employee ID plus the course title, that means that if we hire someone, we have to create a course for them right away. We cannot add an employee without a course. That's, that's an insertion anomaly where you need to create additional data to be able to add a row of data. The update anomaly would be Margaret Simpson gets a raise. How many times do we need to update her salary? Twice. Therefore, we have to update the same data in the same table more than once. That's an update anomaly. Now, some people will look at that and go, well, what's the problem with that? 
with modern computers, it's not as much of a problem as it used to be back in the day. And by back in the day, I'm talking like pretty much before my time. How many of you have watched a movie where they had computers that actually had like tape, reel to like reel to reel tapes? You know, the the tapes are turning and moving back and forth. Old movies, right? You don't see that in modern movies, but in older movies, you'll see like the you know the tapes moving and the tape is going back and forth. Now imagine a database contained on those tapes because that literally was how it was on that magnetic material, and the database systems were smart enough to know how much to move the tape to get between different rows of data. What would happen is Margaret Simpson's record is at one end of the tape, the second record's at the other end of the tape. And we update the salary once, and as the tape is moving, the tape breaks, because that would happen. Now suddenly we have two different values for Margaret Simpson and the computer has shit the bed. When we fix the tape, the entries need to be fixed. And there's risk that something will get missed. That's an update anomaly. Now, a deletion anomaly would be Alan Beaton gets fired because he was cooking the books. So he was being a bad accountant. And he gets fired. Suddenly, what happens? We lose the fact that tax accounting course ever existed. So if we nuke Alan Beaton, Right here, he goes away. We lose the fact that tax accounting ever existed. And therefore, we never don't know if anybody ever took that course. We don't even know it's a course that was available. That's a deletion anomaly. So when you delete a row of data, you lose other data that might not be related directly to whatever it is you're deleting. That is the point of normalization, is to avoid those three situations. Now, well, I just literally finished talking about that slide. But this is for you guys when you come back to look at the slides later. This is what I literally just talked about. Uh, actually, literally example, the, exa the exact examples. Okay, so the important item on this slide is why do these anomalies exist? It's because there's two entities inside that one relationship. We actually have two things inside of it. Therefore, it causes duplication and unnecessary dependency. So if I go back and we look at it, we actually have two kinds of entities. We have an employee record and we have course records. It's two different kinds of entities. What we want to do with normalization is get rid of that stuff. All right, so <laughs> there's many normal forms when we talk about database normalization. Um, the first, second, and third normal forms, we have Boyce Cod and fourth and fifth. You'll notice that Boyce Cod is in the middle between three and four. Um, each of these address specific kinds of issues. A modern properly designed database that is in third normal form is usually considered sufficient for most situations. Sometimes you'll have the odd edge case that requires you to do voice cod. Often when you're in third normal form, you'll also be in fourth and fifth automatically because those handle specific edge cases to the data. They're not common issues. Um, for this course, we're going to focus on first, second, and third, because that'll get you 98% of the way to a properly designed database. Uh, fourth and fifth, like I said, to handle special, specific edge cases, there's actually six normal form and three others that I know of at this point, all of which I've only ever seen used in academia. Um, essentially, somebody needed a dissertation for their PhD. So they invented problems and then created fake solutions to problems they invented. Well, I'm discounting it a little bit, but essentially. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so when create normalization, since I already basically 
talked about the first two points on the slide. Um, so when creating or when doing normalization, there's an accepted notation. It looks like the following. Um, the candidate key for the entity is usually identified by its formatting. It could be bold, italic, or underlined. Um, so if we had an entity called Let's try a different marker because I think this one's destroying the board. We have an entity called student. Wow, this board's freaking terrible. So we have student, and inside of student, we'd have student number name, phone, and a bunch of other things. When we're doing normalization, that's the syntax we use. When you do the lab for normalization, this is the syntax you're gonna use. I don't need you to take the table, slice and dice the tables that the data you're given and give it to me broken down each table with all the data, I don't care. This is the syntax I want. This is the syntax you'd use in the real world. Um, because normally you don't play with just one table of data, you play with lots of tables of data. Okay, right. so that's the syntax we'd be using. Uh, sometimes you don't have the choice, you don't have the option to underline. So I've seen it done also with uh, people putting in like PK next to it, primary key. There's a few different ways to do it. But as long as the primary key is identif easily identifiable, it's usually good to go. Okay, so for the rest of this lab lecture, I mean, we're gonna use this example. Um, as you can see, it's the same black on blue text um, from way back in the day. And currently, this is not a valid entity. It's partly valid. As in, we have a series of attributes, yes. We have our identifier, yes. Can somebody tell me why this is not a valid entity? Well, it has two entities, but that's part of the normalization process. Right now, we can't even start normalizing yet. No, that's that's what the point of the normalization is to get rid of that. The problem we have is we have incomplete rows of data, right? So we look at order number one thousand and six. It's all of this. The problem the problem is is that right now we have multiple rows in it. However, we don't have complete rows. We only got parts of the row. Now. This is known as a repeating group of columns. And if you have a repeating group of columns, the table cannot be normalized. You have to get rid of the repeating group of columns. Can somebody take a guess how you fix that? And trust me, it, the, the answer is stupid simple. Hey? He's got it. What you do is you take this chunk here and you add it here and here. You take this chunk here and you add it there. Now we've got complete rows of data. Everybody's like going, oh, we're creating new things. No, 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 no. We just copy crap. So to be uh, for a relation to be said in first normal form, it has to meet specific criteria. The candidate key is defined. In other words, there's a primary key defined. There's no repeating group of columns and multi-valued attributes are removed. There's a unique name for every attribute or column. So the example on the previous slide could be written using like that syntax I had up here as follows. So you have the order ID, the order date, customer ID, customer name, customer address. Then you'll notice these parentheses. The parentheses denote the fact that this is a repeating group of columns. There is actually a notation for that, for the starting point. The goal is to get rid of those parentheses. 
before we can even say we're in first normal form. So, uh, how do you prepare it? We create the candidate key. So we mark it order ID and product ID. And you get rid of the repeating group of columns by literally duplicating these values in the first block. So right down here. So what's happening now is each row has a value in the order ID and the product ID. And the combination of the order ID and the product ID is unique for each row. So we don't have two rows with the same combination of values. Now we can say we're in first normal form. <clears throat> the first normal form basically means we are able to retrieve a row of data 100% of the time accurately. So we always want the same one and we're able to repeat that. That's the goal of first normal form. So any questions about this before I continue? Yes, we got rid of the repeating group because if we go back, and I lost my mouse, this set here repeats for this value. So this partial row has three repeating set of values tied to it. That's why there's a blank. Okay, so we fix that by not having repeating groups of columns, but because now we have a complete row for each line. Before we only had a partial row, like we had this piece with three values or three rows or three groups of columns. Now what we have is complete rows every time. So we no longer have repeating groups of columns. At this point, we're able to, pull, like I said, pull out any given row of data. We can find uh, how many things were ordered in a given order every single time consistently. And the other, okay. Well, we'll get there. Yeah, master detail, uh, you know, parent, child, whatever you want to call it. Um, yes, eventually that's what we're going to go for. But right now what we've done is we've reached the point where we can put this in a database and retrieve the data. It has tons of problems. It has insertion anomalies. We want to add another product to an order. We have to duplicate the order information for every product we add in. We want to delete a row of data if we really delete the row of data of order ID 1006, this one right here, plus this product ID, we lose the fact that we ever sold cherry as a color or the type of wood. That's the deletion anomaly. If we want to update the price of the entertainment center, we'd have to do it in two places. So it still has all the anomalies are still there. We're just now able to actually work with it. Okay, a candidate key becomes a primary key usually. Not 100% of the time, but a candidate key will usually become a primary key. In this case, it's a composite key, which isn't great. Um, but later on, this is going to get broken down, as you'll see. But normally, a candidate key or the identifier will become a primary key, unless you have to use you know, synthetic keys or something else happens. Okay. But any other questions on first normal form before I proceed? First normal form is the easy one. One, okay. So if we were to rewrite that example, you'd write it like this. It's still a really long entity, but you can see now that there's no repeating groups of columns. 
There's underlines to identify the candidate key or the identifier. Um, so that's where we're starting is this. So second normal form. For an entity to be in second normal form, it must be in first normal form. It's impossible to be in second normal form unless you're already in first normal form. It's like saying you can be Super Saiyan without being a Saiyan in the first place. For those of you that don't watch anime, probably didn't get that reference. Um, or at least watch Dragon Ball Z. Um, but, you know, you cannot be one unless you've already reached the other. Every non-key attribute is fully functional dependent on the entire primary key. In other words, there's no partial dependencies. So if you recall earlier, if I have, say, W, X, Y, and Z, and we know that my identifier is this, and Y is fully dependent on the entire key, but Z is not, that's a partial dependency. So X, W, X determines Y, but if it's just uh, X determines Z, that's a partial dependency. So if this depends on the whole key, but this one only depends on half the key, we have to get rid of that. So we want to get rid of partial dependencies. So the dependencies in this example we had was the order ID determines the order date, the customer number, the customer name, and the customer address. And yes, usually at this point, somebody chirps and says, well, shouldn't the customer number be part of X, Y, Z, like its own identifier? And the answer is we're not getting, we're not there yet because we don't need the customer number to uniquely identify every row of data. Therefore, it's not part of the candidate key. Therefore, it has nothing to do with the partial dependencies. Product ID determines the description, the finish, and the standard price. And quantity ordered is determined by order ID and product ID. So we have some partial dependencies in here. So if I go back to here and what, what, what they're saying is this set is determined by the order ID. This set is determined by the product ID. And this fella here is determined by the entire primary key. Now, we need to get rid of partial dependencies. In other words, we're saying that if this only depends on half the key, we have to fix that. We can't have something that's only dependent on part of the primary key. So how do we fix it? We create, we take that big entity we had and we break it into three pieces. So that every attribute is dependent on the entire primary key. So we've identified that the Order date, customer ID, name, and address is determined by the order ID. Fantastic. So we create an order an order entity. The, we can create a product entity that has a product ID, the description, finish, and product price. And then we have an order line where the quantity ordered, and there's actually a typo on this slide. Man, I thought I'd gone through this properly. Supposed to be another line right there. The quantity ordered is determined by the product ID and the order ID. Now, when we look at this, we are in second normal form. What's kind of cool about the situation is by the initial breakdown that we did, we actually have a few entities now that are already in third normal form by because just because there's no more anomalies in it. And there's no more um, any kind of weird uh, dependencies. They magically became third normal form right off the bat. Technically, they're fourth and fifth normal form too, uh, because there's just no issues with it. An order line currently are in third normal form. We don't even need to think about them anymore. As you'll still go through the process to make sure, but. We still want to get everything in third normal form. So for an entity to be in third normal form, it must be in second normal form. You can't go to third unless you're already in second. 
It's just like if you're playing baseball, you can't go from first base to third base across the field and slap the pitcher on the way by. You have to go all the way around the baseball diamond. Um, it's just how it works. And transitive dependencies are removed. So a reminder, what is a transitive? It's when an attribute can be identified by another attribute that is not part of the candidate key or the primary key or whatever you want to call it. So again, if relation R has attributes A, B, C, and A determines B and B determines C, you can say that A will determine C, that we don't want that. We fix it by breaking it out. Okay, so in this table, our current dependencies are the primary key is order ID. However, customer name and address is determined by the customer ID. Customer ID is determined by order ID. Therefore, we can say, excuse me, order ID determines customer ID. Customer ID determines name and address. Therefore, order ID determines name and address. It is a transitive dependency. We want to get rid of transitive dependencies. So we do it by breaking it out. Literally every time you have some sort of anomaly or a dependency issue, the answer is usually break it down to smaller pieces and break it out. So we can take the order information and break it out as follows. We create a customer table, entity, customer ID, name and address. The order no longer has name and address, but we leave behind the customer ID because we still need to know who the customer was. So the order ID determines the order date and the customer ID. And product ID and order line did not change, right down to the point where I don't have the underline here also. So product and order line have not changed because they were already in third normal form. We fix the order. Now in the current setup we have now, we can change a customer's address in one place. We can change the description of a product in one place. We can change the price of a product in only one place. Quantity ordered, that's pretty safe. It was safe to begin with but it only needs to be changed in one place. If we delete a product, we don't lose customers. We delete a customer, we don't lose a product. There's still a few things we could do to improve this, um, but we're not too worried about that at the moment. So that is the three normal forms that we're worrying about in this course. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use this example that's on the screen and they've put it on a motor. All right, let's go see if I can get this kind of up so I can have more whiteboard. And now I am just going to bring this up and move my camera. And get as much whiteboard as humanly possible going on. Uh, yeah, this is going to be rough. What was that? Uh, it's not going to be that much different, I don't think. I don't know if my wire will even reach. Not without ripping my camera off. Okay, this will work. Okay, because after after the first little bit, I'm just going to turn off the projector anyways. So, okay. So, we have a normalization example up on the screen. It's a table of data. Um, it's brand new to me. I got it to gen. I got uh, Copilot to generate it for me about three weeks ago. 
somebody laughed, but you know, if you're trying to find exercises to practice, Copilot and ChatGPT is amazing. The answers it gives you are going to be ash, but it gives you good examples to start with. I asked it first, I gave it a prompt, and I refined the prompt until it gave me something that was useful for you guys. Um, this used to be the hardest thing as a prof is come up with fresh examples every couple of semesters of this stuff because, you know, it is what it is. Just want to make sure my battery is not dying. Good. All right. So let's take a look at what attributes we have. We have book ID, book title, author ID, author name, genre, genre name, borrow ID, borrow name, borrow date, and return date. Now, anybody want to take a guess which combination of attributes lets you find every row uniquely? Yep, that was somebody who was quick. So the combination of the book ID and the borrow ID, so book ID plus the borrower, lets us find any given row of data uniquely. So a bit like the example we just had, we don't need the author ID and the genre ID have nothing to do with finding each row uniquely. We know that, for example, we have um, catcher in the rye in here twice. The book ID is two but we have two different borrowers with different dates. There's a bit of an assumption in this table of data where a person can never borrow the same book twice. Cool. Um, you know, it would get really complicated if we started worrying about, you know, past that. So to keep things simple, we'd, we're gonna go on the assumption that a person can never borrow a book more than once. So if you didn't get it all in first pass, TFB. Um, so now what we want to do is I am going to transcribe that on the board uh, right over here. So I'm going to send the screen up a little bit. Okay. Actually, I'm going to pull up all the markers. all the colors. Okay, so I'm gonna just write here, then I'm gonna turn off the screen. Okay, so we got, uh, just gonna call the entity lib for now for a lack of anything else better. And we have book ID, book title, And I'm going to run out of horizontal space. So you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to shorten some of these column names. A ID, A name, G ID, G name, B ID. B, name, no. borrow, date, and I'm going to have to go under, and then we got the return date. We don't need the rest of the data for now. So there we go. Now we can all read it without having to deal with the text. I apologize how small the handwriting is. It's gonna get bigger as we go. All right, we will use right now we know that the book ID plus the borrow ID is our candidate key. And we're able to find every row of data with it. This is now in first normal form. A candidate, a candidate key, or a candidate key will become a primary key when you finish the physical design. We're not even at the conceptual design. We are munging data. Okay, so currently we have 
partial dependencies. So I'm going to put in the partial dependencies in orange. So we know that the book title and the genre ID and the genre name is determined by the book ID. We know that the borrower name is determined by the borrower ID. And our full dependency is the borrower date is dependent on the entire identifier. And I am going to put down some color coding over here for you guys. I know the people at the back handwriting is really small. Okay, so, so far, these are the three things we've identified in color on here. So, to be in second normal form, we get rid of the partial dependencies. How do you get rid of the partial dependencies? You break them out or you explode them or you decompose the entity into smaller entities that don't have partial dependencies. So, now we are going to rename our database, our table. It's going to go I still don't know why there's four chairs at the front. So this we can say first. Well, we want to be in second normal form. So we will have book And if anybody's wondering where I'm getting the name of the entities, I'm making them up as I go. As long as it reflects what's in it, you give it a name. Later on, you can probably change the name, but as you're working your way through, things will change. So we have a book. So we have the book ID. Book ID. Book. Title. author id author genre name oh i got it in okay and we know that this is the identifier or Canada key, we have a borrower. Okay, and we have borrower ID. We're name. And heck do I call this? The lending, you know, when you go to the library and you check out a book. I'll call it checkout. There For a lack of a better name. And we know that the borrow date and the return date is determined by the book and the borrow IDs. So we're going to put the book ID, the borrower.
the borrow date and the return date in here. And we know that this is for this, but I am actually going to throw on just one more color, purple. And by the way, when you're doing the labs, you don't need to use all the colors. I'm just putting colors for you guys to actually understand what I'm doing on the board. Okay. This would be the foreign key. All right. So we are currently in second normal form. And when we look at this, we know that the borrower name is fully dependent on the entire primary. Cool. There's nothing else in here. So we can actually say that this one has already reached 3NF because there's no other kinds of dependencies in it. We know that the return date, the borrow date, is dependent on the entire key. Therefore, this one's also in 3NF. Man, that's like one of the worst square brackets I've ever done. Much better. This one, on the other hand, is in second normal form. It's in second normal form because we have transitives. So the author name is determined by the author ID. The genre name is determined by the genre ID. However, the book title, the author ID, and the genre ID depend on the book ID. So what we have in pink here are transitive dependencies. So even though we're in second normal form, we still have transitive dependencies. I have another pink. This one's garbage. This one better? Oh, yeah. And to be in third normal form, what do we do? We decompose further, and anything that is a transitive dependency gets removed into its own entity. So now we are going to do a bunch of entities. So let's start with author. We have author ID. author name, we have genre with the genre ID, genre name, okay, then we have the book, which has the book ID. I'm going to put all the underlines out in a second. Book ID, book name, author ID, and genre ID. 
Okay. We have the borrower. This is the suckiest part of doing this on the board. You have to rewrite everything every time. When you're doing this in Word, you can copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. You have a question? Oh, it is. It should be. Yep. I just can't go much lower than I'm at now. Yeah, it's a, it's got a really wide, wide field, the field of view. Yes. Just let me finish writing it out, and then I'll answer your question. And the last one we had was checkout. So we have the book ID. Or ID. Uh, borrow date. Turn eight like this. All right. And we have primary key. I've had these markers a long time. They're all starting to die on me. Okay, let's try that again. No, oh, that one's dead too. Okay, back to the one I don't like. Okay, book ID, borrow ID, this one, that, this, and that. Those are our primary keys. And we decided purple is the foreign keys. Well, this is a foreign key. That's a foreign key. And these two are foreign keys. Okay. So at this point, when we look at this, none of the entities have partial dependencies. None of the entities have transitive dependencies. We can safely say we are in third normal form. All right. Now, You got a question. Okay. It's when you look at the, you have to look, you have to determine what they are bef basically at this point, right? But normally you wouldn't just do it on the board, you'd do it with the data at the same time. So what you do is you look at, hmm, let's see. Um, I changed the book name. Okay, it's book title. I guess I should fix that, and then I'll explain to you. So, okay, like that. Just got to be consistent. When you look at this, you can say, hey, does the borrower name have anything to do with the book ID? No. The book title has something to do with the book ID. Yes. The author name and the author ID, because they're not part of the candidate key, they have to be dependent on something. We go, does the author name have anything to do with the person borrowing the book? No. Therefore, we can honestly say that pretty much everything over here is partially dependent, not dependent on the entire key. So if you have certain attributes that are only I, I uniquely identified by part of the key, that's a partial dependencies. You have to get rid of that. So that's how you figure out your partials.
on a yeah, and then you still have other things that might depend on the entire key. Well, no, in this case, it's in this case, this structure is actually fairly straightforward. Um, technically, our checkout is a junction table. They actually have a different name than that. Um, and I'll be talking about that next week or the week after what they're actually called. It's past just a junction table because uh, there's extra attributes in there. But essentially, yes, you, you're not always going to have a junction table, but you will have um, multiple tables coming out of it. You're going to break it down in multiple pieces. It's a, an attribute that depends on only part of the key. So the book name, the book title is determined by only the book ID. It has nothing to do with the person borrowing the book. The name, the person borrowing the book has nothing to do with the name of the book. So they're only dependent on part of the key because we identified that the book and the borrower IDs combined was our primary key. Yep, decomposing. Yeah, we're breaking it down. Yes. No. The order of this makes no difference. It's what's inside of it that counts. I just put it in the way that you could, that the parent tables are always above. That's just a habit I picked up years ago when I started teaching this. Before I started teaching normalization, I, did, I just did it whatever way. And then as I was teaching it, I discovered that usually it was easier for students to understand that if you put the tables that don't have foreign keys above everything else, it makes it more sense because it's visually going down, right? These two feed into this one, this one feeds into this one, and this one feeds into this one. That, that's all, it makes no difference. Now, this is the third normal form because a person can change their name without having to change anything else. We can adjust the title of a book without changing anything else. We can change the genre without having to change anything else, without having to go and touch the books. We don't need to go and touch uh, what the person checked out. We can do each piece, each change has to happen in one place and only one place. So a person comes in, checks out a book. A row would be added to the checkout with a borrow date, but there wouldn't be a return date on it yet. So then the person comes back with the book and they, the book is returned and they scan the book in and there's, trust me, there's all kinds of problems with this structure, but for an example, it's good enough. Um, when they scan it in, they would find the book ID plus who borrowed it and update the return date. Well, we only need change it in one place. The goal is, is changing stuff in only one place. In a real library system, If you have five copies of the book, there's five different barcodes, right? Each book has its own entry at the library so that they don't need to look up who borrowed the book. Um, but, you know, so this is the process of normalization from start to end. And now I'm going to take pictures of it. If anybody else wants to get up and take a picture, here's your chance. Hang on, let me just take the pictures so that I, I'll try to post them on the announcements. I'll try to remember to post on the announcements. Let's go right dead on. There we go. But yeah, if anybody wants to get up and take pictures, here's your chance. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying. When you do it in the real world, on the assumption the person can never borrow a book one time. Oh, you borrow the book, you bring it, you never get to borrow it ever again. That's not how it works in the real world, but for an ex otherwise, I'd have like 10 more columns to make this work. <laughs> exactly.
or the borrow date. So in theory, yes, we could add that in. But that's something we do later as part of the design process where we start, you know, with how it, software development's iterative. You make some code, you test it, make sure it works, then you add more features, make sure it works. This structure, honestly, can see tons of improvements, which has nothing to do with normalization. As it stands right now, we still can't identify a book uniquely. We can, but we can only ever have one copy of the book in the library, which is kind of stupid. <laughs> no, no, I've seen it done. Uh, would I do it? No. No, no, I'm not getting mad at you. I I would not do a composite, like a data as part of a composite key. Honestly, once you get to three columns in a composite key, you probably need to rethink what you're doing anyways. Because you're making your queries difficult. Compound key of two columns is fine. If it's an intersection table or a junction table or an associative entity, whatever it is that's going to be called, that's fine. Second, you add a third, you're making things, you're starting to get things complicated. Now, what happens if the person borrows the book, returns it the same day, and then checks it out again the same day? Or they went to the library, borrowed the book, thought they had the wrong book, returned it. And then they go, oh, crap, no, it was right, the right book, and they check it out a second time. Right? At that point, the borrow date would break down also because the person could borrow the same book more than once. They couldn't do it twice on the same day. Yeah, exactly. So now the whole table's a comma, a primary key. That's no good either. That's where everything goes sideways. We this is difficult. We should actually, in the real world, what we'd end up doing is actually creating a synthetic key, which we'll be talking about two weeks. We create a, a, a surrogate or a synthetic key that has nothing to do with the data, the rest of the data. It'd be by itself. I'll be going over that in a couple of weeks. But right now we're just worrying about normalization, not improving our design. Normally, you'll be given a set of data to work with, and then based on that data, you'll make your decisions on how to decompose it and how it's going to be broken down. No, so as part of normalization, which there should be a slide about that, but I guess I forgot to put it in when I was redoing them all. When with normalization, nothing is added and nothing is lost. So you do not create new data points while you're normalizing. That's later. So over here, there will be nothing at this end that wasn't here. Okay. By the same token, everything that was here is over here also. In theory, when you do a proper normalization pass, you can go frontwards. Or you can go backwards. You could theoretically go from this back to that because normalization should be undoable. In other words, you should be able to undo your normalization. Normally, you wouldn't undo the normalization because that's defeating the point of doing a proper database design. But there's cases you want to do that where you have large data. Um, and you want to make it to go faster. So you'd actually create denormalized views of the data for performance reasons. But the goal is, is that everything that was in first normal form is still present in third normal form. And, if, and then you can take third normal form and rewind it back to first normal form. Yeah, that's what, in the end we said, hey, the borrow date, the return date is completely dependent on the ID of who borrowed it and the ID of the book. Therefore, the checkout is that. And then the borrow, we were able to figure out fairly easily. The book was the one that was a little more complicated where it had 
transitive senate. A little silence. Yeah, like I said, this is the worst topic of the semester. It is. Um, that went well, actually. Um, I was just checking my time. I <laughs> sure I wasn't going to go over. Um, so normalization tends to be a fairly hard to digest topic. Um, I don't expect you guys to actually miraculously know it after one lecture. Um, most, a lot of schools that teach this stuff usually don't combine database administration with database design in the same topic. So you end up with like a couple of lectures to cover normalization, not one. But also usually in those courses, students haven't started querying a database with SQL. So you guys are doing things a little backwards, um, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this in one shot in one day. As long as you remember what a partial dependency is, what a transitive is, what a full dependency is, and the keys are cool, you'll do fine. You just have to remember that. Um, the lab that is assigned with this lecture, which should have released, was already released. I want it literally, without necessarily the colors, exactly like this. So I want this syntax written this way. I don't need you to take the tables and you know copy them and paste them and slice the table up into multiple pieces. When you're doing normalization, by the time you've identified what your candidate keys are, you don't need the data anymore. So, yeah. All right, any more questions? Or once? Friday. I know, Sunday. I keep saying Friday, but that's because last semester was Friday, so it's due on Sunday. The lab one, getting your MySQL server, uh, MySQL, or yeah, MySQL and the design stuff set up is due on the 19th, which is Sunday. This lab, which is lab two, will be due on the 26th. So, yes. No, no, no. As long as you underline your primary keys, it's cool. Yeah, the colors is me doing it, so you guys have a visual reference of what each of the pieces I'm talking about. If you want to use colors, knock yourself out. Well, I, I can pretty much tell what they are. <laughs> right? <laughs> Been doing this just a little while. But it's cool. If you want to put in colors, that's fine. If you want to do it black and white, it's fine. As long as you underline your primary keys, I'm happy. Or your your identifiers. Okay. Any more questions? One, two, and 